My name is Robin Whitley, and today I am going to be reading my own novel, Finding Home. I am doing a preface before even opening the book because I wanted to let you know a few things. Uh, the first thing is that I am Southern, and as a result, as I read my book, it's going to sound more Southern than if you were reading it. I only say this because in the introduction, I have an introduction written in dialect, hoping to imitate dialect as I, as is heard from where I grew up. Um, I didn't want to write the whole book in dialect because that's actually very hard. And um, so when I am reading, uh, if I get tired, I may revert to dialect. I hope that's not the case, but you are forewarned that I'm Southerner, and when I get tired, I sound a little more country. Okay, and the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the clock that you'll hear ticking throughout the reading. I decided to let the clock tick because it brings back so many memories of the South for me that I love. In particular, I always connect a ticking clock with my grandma and grandpa Whitley. We would often sit in their living room after Sunday lunch and be quiet and just be with each other. And what you would hear is this. Of course, that meant that sometimes people fell asleep on the couch because the clock could put you to sleep. But I hope that my book doesn't put you to sleep. But that is why the clock is left in. I hope you enjoy my book. Thank you for listening. And thank you for reading. Finding Home A Place to Belong by J. Robin Whitley in memory of Buford Whitley, my daddy. Acknowledgements. The stories that follow are based upon the fiction of my own mind. I would like to acknowledge, however, that the comic events of Beauregard are based upon true events or happenings of my daddy, one of the North Carolina ways of saying daddy. He was a barber, and frustrated inventor. He had odd things happen to him that I've written about as the antics of Bo. I hope you will enjoy his antics as you read the story. Bo's relationships are fictional, however. He and my mom were together until his death. When we were children and said we didn't want to live in the city, mom and dad laughed but stayed in the countryside that we loved. Mom encouraged me to be a a writer when I was younger, but all I could think about was being a musician. I am deeply grateful to all the dear friends who helped me work out the kinks in this first novel. Many thanks go to Katherine Jones McLaren for her willingness to read the worst first drafts ever. Thanks also go to Wesley Satterwhite and Fran Sullivan Foz for their willingness to set aside time from our writers group in Silva to allow me to ask them questions about the storyline or character development when I got stuck. Thanks to Barbara Clanton, Kathy Rollins, and Connie Fazio for being willing to read the rewrite and give me vital feedback. Linda North gave me some good tips on grammar and form. I couldn't implement everything. When you find mistakes, so they are all mine. The other important groups of people to acknowledge are the fine folk who create and live in our rural communities. My life experience has shown them to be hardworking, loving, and trustworthy. It has also been my blessing to live in and be a part of the rural communities where people accepted me, even when they knew I was different, even though they didn't know for sure if I was a lesbian. Solo Dei Gloria.
Introduction The Piedmont The writer of this here book asked me to tell you about some things to get this book to rolling. First of all, I want y'all to remember I ain't no writer. I'm from the country, though, and I can tell some tales. Who else better than a local to tell somebody about a place in the South? Writers like to dress places up and make them places all nice and pretty. If you want to know the truth, ask the country folk. They'll tell you right. If nothing else, they're filled with enough fire and brimstone preaching to make sure to tell the truth. I also told the writer not to correct the spelling on her computer for my part. When she read it back to me the first time, it sounded like some city slicker. Now, the Piedmont begins near about 30 to 40 minutes east, northeast of Charlotte. It's according to where you're going, really. We live between Cabarrus and Stanley counties most of our lives, hardly ever traveling anywhere. If we did, we always took Highway 49 to Charlotte or Ashboro. Sometimes we went to camp in the Uwari National Forest. Now, mountaineers would say that old range looks more like hills than mountains. Still, the Uwaris are older than the Blue Ridge Mountains. Anyhow, once you leave the city on Highway 49, there are miles and miles of farmland. Many would say miles and miles of nothing. But to country folk, those are miles and miles of heaven. Pretty rolling farmland and pastures that make you dream. That there tells you about the where of this story. Now, what else did she want me to tell you? Oh, yeah. Just a bit about when the story happened. Bill Clinton was president, and it was before folks were trying to impeach him. Now, that was quite a time. That's when me and Nanny decided to move closer to the city. We moved in the summer, too, and woo-wee, the summer of 97 was a hot one. Okay, so all summers in the South are hot. How hot it feels to a person is according to how much stress life gives, or if you got hay to bale or fields to plow. At about 480 feet elevation, the Piedmont is a hot box of humidity in the summer, and breezes rarely blow. You gotta remember, west of here, the Blue Ridge Mountains are 5,000 feet or higher in comparison. That's why we're called the Foothills. Now, some consider the Piedmont over near Raleigh. But the folks I grew up saw that as just another big old city. The Piedmont means Foothills, and Raleigh is not near the Foothills of anywhere I can tell. Maybe you're always near the foothills of the Uaris, but like I said, they ain't that big. I'm getting off the story, and now the writer tells me I'm in the wrong season. Still, you can't know how good it feels in the Piedmont fall unless you know how hot the summers are. Some folks that cuss say it's hotter than H-E-double-L or Hades. Every day is like one natural steamer after another. My mom and daddy always got up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get their chores done before it got hot. Then they'd sit on the porch after lunch, drinking iced tea and falling asleep in the rockers. By August, the dog days made it feel like summer would drag on forever. You couldn't wait until September came. Of course, while September cooled off some, the heat would still come around. Now that I think about it, September's a lot like a menopausal woman. A lot of hot flashes in between the cool spots. We couldn't wait till October. Or better yet, November, when it was sure to cool down a bit. I can't remember exactly what was popular in country music in 1997. I liked All My Exes Live in Texas by George Strait. Don't tell my wife, though. She thinks it encourages the sin of D-I-V-O-R-C-E. I can't rightly recollect exact years of songs, so that might be wrong. It was hard to listen to the radio on my combine much when I was in the fields. Nanny only wanted to play gospel on the old radio when I was in the house. As you can tell, I might wear the pants in the house, but I ain't the one in charge. She's a good woman, though. 
Neither of us likes that bumpy, jumpy music. Now, the story this here writer is about to tell you set in the country. She hopes that by reading my introduction, you can get a sense of how most everybody talks. Those that went to college might try and talk more formal. There are always country folk that try to act like they something they ain't. Now, Maddie wasn't like that. She could talk with the city slickers and then, just as easy, fall back into the brogue of pleasant quarry. She's proof that just because young got education, there's no need to get on a high horse or get too big for your britches. There's one more thing to remember. In 1997, it was still a bit dangerous in the rural areas of the South to admit you might be a homosexual. Um, most often pronounced homosexual in that time, if you lived in the country. The KKK could still sneak into the areas with all the country back roads. In fact, we heard them hollering over the hill behind our house one night. There were a few folk you could talk to and be honest about your life, but you had to be careful. Me and Annie got tired of the secrecy and fear, so we finally up and moved to the city when we retired. It's easier to hide here. We still miss the country, though. Those beautiful mornings with the birds singing or the sound of rain on the old tin roof. You can take the woman out of the country, but you really can't take the country out of the women. Quote from when we were orphans. Perhaps there are those who are able to go about their lives unfettered by such concerns, but for those like us, our fate is to face the world as orphans, chasing through long years the shadows of banished parents. There is nothing for it but to try and see through our missions to the end as best we can, for until we do, we will be permitted no calm. Katsuo Ishiguro from When We Were Orphans Chapter 1 Characters Madsen a brilliant palette of colors washed across the horizon of the sky. Earth and wood scents rose from the ground like incense rising in prayer. Fall finally woke up with the chill of winter, and there was a scent of excitement in the late November air. Madsen loved nature as though it was a part of her own body. Each leaf of the tree was a word of love, each particle of soil a kiss to her feet. Walking the land was her peace, her prayer. Her log home was almost complete. All that remained was to hang the art. She thought that the building of the new house would also be her own completion. With it finished, she had achieved all of her goals in life. Instead, she felt a longing for something more. She bent down and rubbed the rich soil of the fallow field between her hands. Although the ground was hardening from the cold, the soil was so rich that in the warmth of her hand it melted like fudge. She liked the feel of the soil and held it up to smell its woody, earthy fragrance. She had seen her grandfather do this many times as he evaluated the ground's potential for a new crop. This will be good for gardening, she thought. She heard the hoofbeat of her horse approaching the fence. Lightning was always there for her. He always seemed to sense when she needed a friend. Today, she wished for more companionship than a horse could give. On a whim, Madsen decided to accept her friend's invitation to go dancing in the city. She went into the house to get ready. Leah. Morning arrived like a hangover. 
everything was too noisy. The city streets screamed with the pain of a city in the morning. In the movies, the dullest morning seemed glorious and full of hope, or at least the morning had good lighting. This day appeared to be like the rest of her mornings. There was no glory, not even sunshine, and a feeling of no hope. Leah kept trying to find the bright side of life, but circumstance always seemed to put a dimmer on everything. Well, at least on the hope of love. She had given up on love long ago. And especially the hope of extra sleep. The cat, Miss Cookies, was determined that rising time was 6.30 sharp. Without fail, Miss Cookies chose to sharpen her claws on the red door of Leah's bedroom each morning. The sound shrilled through the morning like awakening to the sound of fingernails scraping across a blackboard. Now it was time. Time to get up and start the routine. Time to get up and live the life that was not hers. Scuffling to the kitchen, Miss Cookies talked to her, giving orders for breakfast, asking for treats and a clean litter box. Leo wished the cat would let her sleep in on Saturdays and Sundays. Then Leah remembered that her dad had encouraged her to go out with his co-worker Johnny and her partner. She was a bit excited about making new friends in the city, so it was a good thing she was awake and moving. She could clean up the apartment a bit. She didn't know whether to be excited or afraid. It had been so long since she had gone out. Work took all of her time, and music was all of her dreams. Her last relationship had threatened to wreck her career. Leah tended to choose lovers who were sexy, smart, and controlling. Her last relationship was more like a prison sentence than a relationship. It's why she felt off track, as though she was living someone else's life. She no longer knew what she wanted and sometimes wondered who she was. Leah stared at her counter in a daze until Ms. Cookies rubbed against her legs, reminding her of the morning tasks at hand. As she bent to pet the cat, Leah pulled her long hair out of her face and slipped it behind her ear. Miss Cookie, I promise that tonight there will be nothing but dancing. I will be a good mama and not bring a stranger home. Leah was hugging the cat. Or trying to anyway. Miss Cookies jumped out of her arms, twirled at Leah's feet, and cried louder. Laughing, Leah stood and walked to the pantry. I know, I know, feed the cat. That's all I'm good for, right? The cat purred in agreement. Before she knew it, the day had flown by, but she still needed groceries. Maybe she should skip going out. She didn't really know Johnny. Then she thought about how her ex had ruined her life and friendships. Those friendships had little depth, but still, there were no others to hang out with, and lately she had been spending too much time with her parents. In her indecision, she began to bite at her fingers. She looked at the clock thinking about how long she would need to get ready. What will it hurt, she muttered to herself. She grabbed her purse and keys, then dashed down the stairway to her car. At least it was only a few blocks to the fresh market. She could get groceries and return with enough time to eat supper before getting ready to go out. The sun was setting earlier each day. By the time Leah stepped out of her car, dusk was falling. She en enjoyed the hues of the sky as she drove. The traffic was light for a change. She wondered where every wa everyone was on a Saturday night. She wondered where everyone was on a Saturday night. 
then remembered there was a Panthers game downtown. She found a parking spot closer to the store than usual. She pulled into the space and watched the colors of the sky change before getting out. As she started to the store, she realized she had forgotten her jacket. She locked her car and then raced to the store to warm up faster. As she approached the store's door, cigarette smoke wrapped around her like a bad dream. At least it was a bad dream for her. Leah looked for the smoker and saw a woman leaning on the right wall at the door. Wisps of smoke still curled about her head as though she was a witch from another time and place. If the woman was an employee, she was going to complain to the manager. What's the point of having a smoke-free environment if a customer must walk past a smoker to get into the store? Leah's indignation was immediate. She was still annoyed when, upon closer inspection, she saw that the smoker was not an employee. She watched the smoker in hopes to catch her eye and to give her the evil eye. The woman did look at her, then smiled and winked. Leah's heart fluttered a bit because the smoker's eyes were beautiful, and in another quick glance, she saw that the woman was muscular. As she entered the store, she wished the woman hadn't been a smoker. What a waste of a fine-looking woman, she thought. She tested a few carts until she found one that rolled smoothly. She could still smell the smoke from outside. Determined not to look again, she started towards the produce section. One of the things Leah loved about the fresh market was that she could actually smell the scent of the fruit. She took a deep breath to clear her head of the smell of cigarette smoke. The scent of the fruit rose as a lullaby to her nose, old-time aromatherapy. The first scent she caught was that of the apples. She reached out to touch them, feel the firmness. Her favorite apples, honey crisps, were in season, and she felt she could see the freshness though she knew that it was the color of all the apples that also astounded her. The greens and yellows of the vegetables also painted a tangible portrait of food for her body as well as her soul. She often found herself dwelling on the beauty of the produce section when she got home. She would bite into a fresh apple, close her eyes, and revisit the picture of life in the fresh food as she tasted the juicy flesh of fruit. Into her pleasing reverie walked the smokestack. The woman walked up to her like an old friend, acting as familiar with her as Leah's seven-year-old cat. Leah would swear that if the woman had had a tail, it would have wrapped around her leg. Leah ignored her and moved further into the store although she had not picked out enough vegetables for the week. She had heard that the market was often a pickup place for tamer individuals. She wasn't buying it, though she had to admit it seemed safer than picking up someone in a bar. Yet, Leah spooked herself, looked over her shoulder, and found that the woman had backed off and was shopping just like her. She breathed a sigh of relief. She decided to skip the bar. She had enough drama in her last relationship to last a lifetime. Pearl. Clinking glasses sounded like small bells begging for service. The sticky air of the restaurant made it feel like mid-August, even in the cold of late November. December was still a day away, but it felt like winter already and the Christmas season even closer. The rush of the shoppers preparing for their holiday meant one thing. She might make enough money to have heat all winter. 
thank fate for the kerosene heater. She once would have thanked God, but everyone talked about a loving God who provided for every need and lifted the brokenhearted. After all her years of praying to that God, she was still poor and downhearted. It was less disappointing to believe that fate guided life. At least it would not give the impression that you had some control over the events of life. You do what you have to do. You take care of things as they come, and if fate chooses, then you might be okay. If not, then you might live a life like Pearl's. Pearl was born in the country on a farm outside of Pleasant Quarry. She lived with hopes of making it to the big city one day. She had even gone to community college to obtain a degree in culinary arts. The farthest away she had moved, however, was only five miles from her home place. Even then, it had taken her most of her life to get there. She lived out the past 50 years doing what her parents told her to do, and it had been a hard existence. Still, she was an only child. Her parents never wanted her to marry or move away or do anything other than milk the cow, feed the chickens, and help Mama with supper. Of course, this meant that she had no social life and little experience with a job outside of the farm. When both parents died in the same year, it was overwhelming. After she got them buried, the town accountant told her that she would have to sell the farm to pay off her daddy's debts. She was devastated. That was when she decided to give up on God. She didn't have much, and that was taken from her. After the debts were paid, enough remained for her to purchase a house trailer and a small seedy lot. She now owned a used but decent single-wide trailer. She first hoped to have enough for a car, a used Ford Pinto, but her dad's old truck still ran and was the only thing that was debt-free. She hated that old truck, but she kept it. After all her hard work for her parents, she had a small home and an old Chevy pickup to keep her through the remainder of her life. All she needed was a job. When Joe at the local diner gave her a job as sometimes a waitress and sometimes a cook, she knew she would at least have something to eat. Joe fed his help the meals they needed while working. During the Christmas season, waitresses really made the money. Today, she had been a waitress, and she was happy as she counted her tips again. She liked cooking the best, but waiting tables sometimes put more cash in her pocket. Either way, she was glad for work to keep her busy during the day. It had been a long time since she worked for pay. It was nice to have her own money. For the first night in a long time, she was going to sleep easy.